I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. One of the foremost thinkers and illuminators of truth is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. It is an honor to speak to him from my home in Tehran and to hear of his vivid views, many of which came from questions that I derived from his many books and articles. Paul Craig Roberts is chairman of the Institute for Political Economy. Dr. Roberts has held academic appointments at Virginia Tech, Tulane University, University of New Mexico, Stanford University, George Mason University, and Georgetown University. He has contributed chapters to numerous books and has published many articles in journals of scholarship. Dr. Roberts' latest books are The Neoconservative Threat to World Order, How America Was Lost, and The Failure of Laissez-Faire Capitalism. These books have had English, German, French, Czech, Chinese, Korean editions and a forthcoming Russian edition of How America Was Lost. Dr. Roberts was associate editor and columnist for The Wall Street Journal and columnist for Business Week and the Scripps Howard News Service. His articles have also appeared in The New York Times and Harper's. He was a nationally syndicated columnist for Creators Syndicate in Los Angeles. In 1992 he received the Warren Brooks Award for Excellence in Journalism. In 1993 the Forbes Media Guide ranked him as one of the top seven journalists in the United States. President Reagan, appointed Dr. Roberts Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy and he was confirmed in office by the U.S. Senate. From 1975 to 1978, Dr. Roberts served on the congressional staff. After leaving the Treasury, he served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Commerce. Dr. Roberts was awarded the Treasury Department's Meritorious Service Award for his outstanding contributions to the formulation of United States economic policy. In 1987 the French government recognized him as the artisan of a renewal in economic science and policy after half a century of state interventionism and inducted him into the Legion of Honor. In 2015 he was awarded the Press Club of Mexico's International Journalism Award. He is listed in Who's Who in America and Who's Who in the World. In 2017 Dr. Roberts was awarded Marquis Who's Who Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roberts. It's, I've, I've read your articles in the past. Let me begin with a little bit of history because you've been around uh, quite a long, long time and um, in good health, uh, um, uh, alhamdulillah. Let me begin with this. You were uh, Assistant uh, Secretary of Treasury during the Reagan era. This is a very interesting period in American history uh, where many things began. And I wanted to, I always ask my guests who've been there at that time, and you were in the government, you were in the Reagan government, uh, how can you compare the Treasury Department of that era, of the Reagan era, with uh, Mr. Mnuchin's uh, era, where we are harvesting so many sanctions here in Iran? <laughs> uh, there's no comparison. <clears throat> uh, the Reagan Treasury... Uh, uh, respected uh, domestic and international law and um, uh, didn't have uh, uh, a foreign policy agenda uh, to achieve uh, hegemony. Um, 
the Reagan administration treasury uh, wanted to end stagflation. That is the simultaneous rise in inflation and unemployment. Uh, uh, Dr. Roberts, one of the things that I think is important that people forget is how the neocons slipped into the White House. I mean, in the 70s, uh, you didn't have these think tanks in Washington. You didn't have the Zionist lobby so active in Washington. In the mid 80s, these people started moving in and you had out of the blues came a Zionist evangelist combination of Zionism and Christianity, which also I, I was there in the 70s in the US, mainly in Virginia, in fact, and it didn't nothing, nothing of the sort was there at the time. After 1979, at the advent of the Islamic revival and the, the, the Iranian revolution, you had the coming in of this new group that to this day is a, a threat for the domestic population in the US and the world as a whole. Can you talk about how these people appeared in the scene? Uh, yes. <clears throat> They were primarily Zionist Jews who had been part of the left wing, sort of uh, Trotskyist left wingers who favored uh, world revolution. And they were able to uh, enter the Reagan administration by presenting themselves as uh, anti-Soviet. They uh, had publications uh, uh, supporting uh, the Cold War against the Soviets. And so they were able to be accepted by conservatives who were always uh, uh, called uh, by the left wing or the liberals, anti-communist, anti-communist, and all of a sudden here were left wingers who were anti-communist. So the conservatives sort of seized on them as a support base. They could say, well, look, these are lefties. These are former communists and they are anti-communist. So what's so bad about us being anti-communist? So that's how they they, the neoconservatives got in and they took over uh, the conservative publications, the conservative foundations, and they used their image as uh, anti-Soviets, anti-Russians, to get into the Reagan administration. And they began their policies of sort of uh, uh, hegemony, but it caused the um, Iran-Contra scandal. Um, the uh, Nicaraguan interventions, and these were illegal and proved an embarrassment uh, to President Reagan, and he fired the neoconservatives. They were all fired and dismissed. And most of them were prosecuted, and many of them were convicted, including very high officials in the CIA. And even the uh, Secretary of Defense, whose name was Weinberger, he was indicted and faced a trial. But it was Reagan's successor, George Herbert Walker Bush, who pardoned all of these people. It's not quite clear the real reason, but it may have been that they were simply seen as over-eager people resisting Soviet communism. And therefore, since they were on the right side, uh, they shouldn't be uh, punished uh, for their um, wrong behavior. So 
that may have been an explanation. That is an explanation that conservatives would have accepted that they were properly allied against the Soviets, but went too far in their methods. Well, with uh, Clinton in office, in his second term with the attack on Yugoslavia, Serbia, uh, these people came back in. And then they totally dominated the administration of George W. Bush. Every important position and, um, in the uh, Defense Department, the Pentagon, was held by a neoconservative. And essentially the same thing in the Department of State and in the security agencies so that we saw a complete change in the makeup of the people in charge of United States foreign policy. It became in the hands of Zionist Jews. And it's remained there. Uh, the Obama administration, we again saw dominance of these neoconservatives for example, Victoria Newland, who was the Assistant uh, Secretary of State, is the one who uh, did the planning for the overthrow of the elected Democratic uh, President in the Ukraine and the establishment of a basically neo-Nazi type uh, government. And <clears throat> so these people continued under the Obama, and now we see again in Trump, in the Trump administration, uh, extremely uh, prominent Zionist Jews running the foreign policy of the United States government. You know, somebody like yourself who has been part of uh, the Reagan government and has been an eyewitness, I always um, and, and also are, are brave enough to express what has been going on, which is not expressed in the mainstream media. So that's why you have an alternative media. My question to you is, when did, you, when did the spark come for you to start speaking out about certain deviations coming up in the U.S., where the U.S. becomes foreign to the U.S. citizens? When did that spark and that uh, call came for you? Well, I'm not sure it just sort of grew. If you're a part of the process and you're observing it, and then all of a sudden it starts changing. And the people making decisions are different people and they're making them on different basis. And you see the interest of other countries being put, and such as Israel, being put in ahead of the interests of the United States. Uh, you can't help but connect it to the personnel. And so, whereas originally um, I was content with the neoconservatives as they were uh, anti-Soviet and the Soviets were perceived, rightly or wrongly, as a threat. Um, and as conservatives had been uh, denounced, denounced for decades by liberals for being anti-communist, it was nice to have left-wing allies. <laughs> but uh, I don't think any of us realized their true nature. Um, uh, no one expected they would end up controlling all conservative publications and all conservative foundations and that all monies, all philanthropic monies that had gone to uh, conservative uh, uh, scholars and researchers would now go into think tanks advancing the interest of Israel. Well, that's what's happened. Um, it's essentially impossible for 
a real American conservative to get financial support from any of the former conservative philanthropic foundations because the money is now uh, <clears throat> completely under the control of um, Zionists. So it just sort of uh, opened itself up. <laughs> you didn't need a spark if you were if you were a participant, uh, you could see it happening around you. So this is the outcome of two things. One, uh, the effort of Reagan to end the Cold War and to take all the help he could get from, from uh, people regarded as left-wing, or formerly as left-wing, <coughs> and from the neoconservatives seeing the opportunity to establish American hegemony. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, there wasn't a check on American unilateralism. And so these two things came together and we have the current situation, which is very dangerous. It's very dangerous in the world because uh, the Russians and the Chinese, who are powerful, military states do not trust Washington. They don't believe a word Washington says. And this is the huge difference from the 20th century Cold War. During the 20th century, every American president worked with Soviet leaders to reduce tensions, to build trust. But since the Clinton regime, every American president has worked to worsen relations, to raise tensions. And all of the trouble that Trump has experienced in his first term is due to the fact that he said he was going to normalize relations with Russia. But to normalize relations with Russia, means that the vast budget, which is $1,000 billion annually of the military security complex and all the power that goes with it, is up for grabs if we don't have a Russian enemy. When you have a budget that big and you have... Um, uh, security agencies able to operate outside of the law, both domestic and international, there has to be a justification, and the justification is the Russian threat. So when Trump said he was going to neutralize that threat and normalize relations, he endangered the profit and power of the military security complex. And that is where Russiagate came from. The whole purpose of Russiagate, which is a hoax, is to prevent Trump from normalizing relations. Here, I revert to one of the articles you wrote recently, and it's, in, it's titled, As We Face Armageddon, the Western World is Leaderless. And you talk about that, within, that we came within 10 minutes of igniting a general conflagration in the Middle East, the consequence of which could have been catastrophic for all. And this is what happened a couple of weeks ago. We came very close and you, you point to two things. First, the word I'm interested in is Armageddon. Uh, this, the second uh, aspect is, um, and I had an interview last week with uh, several experts on this, of how the decision was made the last minute to block it and avoid really a total catastrophe. Further in your article, if I may just add that, you bring up an interesting point and you say, you're not so sure whether it was a good idea to stop it <laughs> or maybe it would have been a good idea. And then you use very, very harsh words about uh, what you think about the situation and especially about the way the U.S. is being run today, where you think, that the way it's, you say, they believe that catastrophic American defeat, 
defeat is the only way peace can be restored to the world. Um, you say some of the tiny percentage of people in the Western world who are still capable of thought regret that t Trump called off the insane plan. They think the con consequences would have been the destruction of the Saudi and Israeli governments, two of the most evil in history, and the cutoff of oil to the US and Europe with the resulting depression causing the overthrow of the Western Mormonger governments. They believe that catastrophic American defeat is the only way peace can be restored to the world. What do you say to that? Your own words. Well, I'm just, I'm reporting the views of people who so um, not necessarily um, a good thing in Trump halting the attack. Uh, these are people who say that N nothing has changed, and we'll just repeat the situation, and we'll have another close call. Maybe it'll be two minutes next time. <laughs> and then the third time, uh, not at all. And so they were just pointing out, I think, <clears throat> I don't think they really were looking forward to such dire consequences. I think they were mainly just illustrating uh, the danger that we're in and how hard it is to do anything about it. And and I think they were emphasizing that Trump calling it off doesn't mean it's called off forever. It's called off until the neoconservatives can orchestrate another excuse. I, I think that attack was based on the false flag attack on the oil tankers or whatever the ships were, the Japanese ship and the uh, other ship from uh, one of the Emirates, and the shooting down uh, by Iran of the drone. So the neoconservatives uh, went to Trump and said, look, you can't let them get away with this. We'll look like we're weak. The world won't be scared of us anymore. Blah, blah, blah. You've got to do something. You have to save face. And so this, I think, is if Trump was even informed of the attack, uh, this would have been the reason that they could sell it to him. Look what they've done. You can't permit this to go unchallenged. So I think that that's uh, the people that I was referring to and uh, paraphrasing, I don't think they were direct quotes, but they were simply stressing the difficulty of the situation and that it has not gone away. Yes, 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 indeed. indeed. In another article which I found very interesting... Just, I'm, not endorsed, I'm not endorsing a call for Armageddon. Yes, I understand. I understand. I understand. Trying to make people understand the seriousness and the danger of the situation. You can't, a country can't go around convincing powerful countries like Russia and China, or for that matter, even Iran, that they're going to be attacked without expecting those countries to maybe be attack first rather than sit and wait and be a sitting duck. So it's very dangerous to tell Russia, to convince Russia that you're, going, you're preparing a nuclear attack on Russia, which is what we've done. We, we've convinced them. I saw the other day where a bunch of Russian strategic analysts have concluded that uh, an American attack on Iran is the beginning of an attack on Russia. Well, this is extremely dangerous. And to have the United States government going around issuing threats right and left, this is suicidal for the world. And it shows recklessness and irresponsibility that, in my opinion, is unmatched in human history. And yet the United States government masquerades as some kind of a great do-gooding organization. But it actually has placed the world 
under dire threats. You know, they have this group, uh, atomic scientists, uh, who have the doomsday clock. And they've moved it up, I think, to two minutes to midnight. And in other words, they say the situation is the most extreme ever. So this is all I'm trying to bring out, to make people aware that the stakes are life on Earth. And therefore, they've got to be able in some way to constrain the reckless irresponsibility of the United States government. You have, you have also another very beautiful article comparing uh, President Kennedy to Pence. Uh, Kennedy's speech at AU in Washington back in 63, five months before he was assassinated. That great speech he made th there very spontaneous words that uh, were seeking peace. And then Pence in, at West Point uh, basically threatening or uh, providing the grounds for further wars, talking to the cadets to prepare for war and to be killed in the way of the neocons. This comparison is also, uh, uh, you, you're comparing two different ages and how insane things have become. Uh. John F. Kennedy, this was an, an age before there were any neoconservatives with a doctrine of American world hegemony. Um, what Kennedy wanted to do, particularly after the missile crisis in Cuba with the conflict with the Soviets. I mean, there was a huge danger there of nuclear war, and Kennedy saw he could not get the kind of support for uh, reducing those tensions that he needed from his own security agencies or his own military, and had to directly negotiate with Khrushchev. So, it was this direct intervention by Kennedy outside the official channels of government that prevented the Cuban Missile Crisis from turning into a nuclear exchange. And so he realized how dangerous this whole Cold War thing was. And he was committed from that point on to neutralizing that threat. In fact, he made the decision and told his brother that as soon as he was reelected, the American forces were pulling out of Vietnam. Now, these are the two reasons he was assassinated. Because, again, he was getting in the way of the military security complex's need for enemies to justify its budget and its power. And when he refused uh, their various false flag scenarios to justify an invasion of Cuba, they decided he was soft on communism and a danger uh, to the country and a danger to their interests and that he had to go. Well, Pence, he comes in an era that when we've had the neoconservative ideology of U.S. hegemony for 20 years, or maybe longer, 30, almost 30 years. And this ideology is just normal. It's no longer new, it's institutionalized in the thinking of uh, security analysts, of think tanks and universities and foreign policy. It's institutionalized in the State Department, the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon, American supremacy, American unilateralism. Uh, they don't like it. 
that somehow countries have come up that are able to serve as constraints on American unilateralism. Uh, this is normal, and so for them, they are defending American unilateralism because that's normal. Whereas John F. Kennedy didn't have any such idea. <laughs> there wasn't any such ideology when John F. Kennedy was president of U.S. world hegemony. The whole idea would have been absurd with the Soviet Union sitting there. <laughs> so this is the big difference. Um, the neoconservatives have remade the consciousness of policymakers. It's no longer uh, working with others. Uh, it's no longer trying to find uh, solutions to ideological conflicts or material conflicts, economic conflicts. It's how do we determine events in the world and not have others constrain us as we determine the events in the world. So that's a huge difference. And so when Pence is telling the uh, cadets, I think, at West Point, one of the military academies, uh, that uh, they will most certainly find themselves at war fighting for America. <laughs> well, this is, this is uh, evidence that, at least in Pence's mind, uh, the United States or Washington intends to continue its unilateral course. And the Israelis are pushing that in the case of Iran. Israel has to get rid of Iran in order to get rid of Hezbollah so that Israel can grab Lebanon. And and the neoconservatives are their agents. Uh, there's no such thing as a neoconservative who's not an agent of Israel. And many of us regard them as serving Israeli interests, not the interests of the United States, so that we have all of these foreign spies, if you want to call them, <laughs> in the top positions of our own government who are acting in behalf of a foreign country. This is the way that uh, the neoconservatives are seen by their critics, by the people who are not taken in, uh, by the notion that we are exceptional and indispensable and have the right to rule the world. People who are not taken in by that see what's going on, and they see that the United States is serving the interest of Israel and thereby putting the world at risk of nuclear war. Uh, my last comment and perhaps question is, um, since 9-11, uh, there's been a wide awakening, an illumination among American activists, whistleblowers, uh, academicians, former officers, former government high officials uh, who are voicing their voices and being able to communicate within and without the U.S. And this is a phenomenon that I, I don't think has ever existed before in the history of the world and the U.S. together. To have so many people waking up, realizing what's going on, and standing up for it, regardless of intimidation. Well, uh, I don't know how many. It is true that there are now 3,000 architects and engineers, and a smattering of physicists and nanochemists and former high government officials 
and military and commercial pilots and first responders or firefighters who are totally convinced that the official explanation of the events of September 11, 2001 are wrong, that the story is not conceivable. It's not conceivable on um, physical grounds. It's not conceivable on engineering or architectural grounds. Uh, it's not conceivable even in terms of government policy because the official story of 9-11 is one of the total failure of the American national security state. Every element of the national security state was defeated by a handful of Saudi Arabians with box cutters. This is a fantasy. But if it happened, I know for a fact, if, if the story was true, there would have been screaming and yelling by the president to find out who was responsible for the failures. The Congress would have been holding all kinds of hearings. How come every part of the national security state failed? And all kinds of heads would have rolled. People would have been replaced. They would have said, how can you allow the superpower to be totally defeated by a handful of young Saudi Arabian men who were acting independently of any government or any intelligence service. It makes us look like complete stupid nitwits. Everyone would have been fired. Everyone. There would have been an uproar. Instead, what happened? The president and the vice president refused any inquiry. For one year. During the course of that year, all the evidence was destroyed. All the steel that showed evidence of nanothermite, of, of uh, controlled demolition, was sent off to China, melted down, and made into cars or something else. Um, then, finally, they had to uh, have. Uh, a hearing because the families of the 9-11 victims were demanding and demanding and demanding and demanding. And so they appointed a political commission, the 9-11 commission, which made no investigation whatsoever. It sat there and wrote down whatever the government told them. <laughs> and they said this was a report. <laughs> and the report makes no sense. And it avoided all the evidence. It simply ignored it. And so what it shows is that whoever carried off this false flag event has no respect whatsoever for the intelligence of the American population, that anyone could expect anyone to believe such an unbelievable story. We, we know from physics that there's not enough gravitational energy in the Twin Towers to turn everything into dust. <laughs> so it's not. Physicists, you can measure the gravitational energy of the buildings and you know that uh, they're not going to just turn into dust. Uh, Anyone looking at the buildings can see that they're blowing up, that they're not falling down from asymmetrical structural damage. They're blowing up. Anybody can see that, and yet the American people couldn't see it. Now, whether or not the correct view that this was somehow a staged event in order to launch the neoconservatives' war in the Middle East that they had called for, it's difficult because any expert, any physicist, any architect, any engineer, any former high government official who raises the question is dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. Uh, 
Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. And so the ordinary public, it doesn't know anything about architecture or engineering or physics. <laughs> it, it hasn't any independent ability to weigh the evidence that is abundant. They can't even tell a building that's blowing up. <laughs> So it makes it extremely difficult to get the story out. In fact, it's even more difficult because consider physicists. You would think by now that every physicist in the United States, indeed the entirety of the Western world, would have stood up and said, this is a false story. Why haven't they? They don't dare because their careers are dependent on government grants. There's hardly any physicists in the United States who are operating independently of government grants. And even if they are, their department isn't. So if they make trouble and the department's funding is threatened, out they go. In fact, we know this precisely what happened to Stephen Jones. He was the first ther uh, physicist who stood up and said, this account's preposterous, it's inconsistent with all known laws of physics. Well, he had to leave the university. So, the, and if you're an architect, you have an architectural firm, and you come up and say, well, this is, uh, this is preposterous, then you lose your clients, because they say, oh, he's on the side of uh, Muslim terrorists, he's making apologies for Muslim terrorists. If you're an engineering firm and you come up and say, well, this story is preposterous, then you lose your class because you're seen as anti-American. You're challenging the government? You mean you don't believe the American government? Why are you defending these terrorists? And so this silences people. It silences engineering firms, architectural firms, physicists. You can see how. And so this is the reason uh, the story has survived now almost 20 years. Uh, it's rank nonsense. Uh, we have the case of the Israelis who were caught filming the event, which meant they had to be set up ready so they knew it was going to happen. <laughs> uh, they've actually said on Israeli television when they were interviewed, well, we were sent there to film it. Well, how can they be sent there to film something unless they knew about it? And how would they knew about it if they weren't part of it? Well, these questions, if you raise them, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're an anti-American. You hate, you hate your own country. Why don't you move to Iran? This is what they say. So it makes it extremely difficult for the public to become aware uh, most people would simply tell you, oh, the government would never kill its own people. Uh, and they think you're crazy because you think the United States government or some element of it or some part of it, you know, not the whole government. I doubt, I doubt the whole government knew anything about it. <laughs> so the, the reason I'm belaboring this is to make it clear to you and your audience that it's extremely difficult for truth to stick its head up. There's so many people ready to shoot it and blow the head off. <clears throat> and that an individual voice is small compared to all the firepower that will come in on that voice. And so this is how governments get away with false flag attacks. Um, Iran should do everything it can to minimize confrontations. And the Russians and the Chinese would respect that and appreciate it. And in the end, uh, for Iran to survive, they're going to need the support of Russia and China. Uh, Dr. Roberts, thank you for the all the wise points you made, uh, and I hope that it re reaches two audiences, uh, an international audience and also a local audience here after we get through with this. I appreciate it. 
I think what you expressed was a combination of all your different articles plus new stuff. I'm glad that you expanded on some of the things that have happened in the past. I, I've read your articles on 9-11 before, but your expression this time also uh, is, is, is great because a lot of people in this country don't really know what happened, uh, the intricacies of what happened and the results and all the different policies that came as a result of that. So I'm very glad that I'm talking to you from, from Tehran, from my house, to your house. And uh, thank God there's the internet still working before they stop us from communicating uh, and uh, blocking all means of communication. Um, God bless you. Thank you so much for the time you put. Wish you the best in health. Uh, God willing, you'll be successful with a long life where you, uh, the way you've devoted yourself to expressing many points that we here uh, need to know about the intricacies and uh, hopefully, God willing, we'll have a better world in the future after all this uh, turmoil. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure having Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. See you next week and God bless you.